we look back 100 years at the history of this city, and we see great immigrant communities. We think of the Lower East Side. We think about the great waves of immigration that came through Ellis Island. And we think about the diversity of New York 100 years ago, because New York was a diverse place, heavily European, but nonetheless very diverse. 100 years from now, people are going to look back at us. <clears throat> and they're going to look back at us in amazement. And what I want to try to do today, in the few minutes I have, is give you a sense of why that's true, why I can predict the future. <laughs> uh, demographers don't like to say that, but the fact is that 100 years from now, people will look back and say, what an incredible place. And my hope is that by doing that, I will impress upon you why you're living in a point in history in a place that is truly remarkable. And I'm going to start by talking about, there's about six points. My first one is called the population dynamic. <clears throat> and it affects all of us. I start with a chart of the top cities in the United States in 1950 to give you perspective. You see the list there in 1950, what the top cities, what the list look like. <clears throat> you see what's happened to many of those cities. And I'm not going to pick on any individual city, but the list can go on. It can include Buffalo, Cincinnati, Cleveland. There are many cities that are actually on this list <clears throat> that were once mighty cities of this country that have taken hits in their population. And you see some of the numbers here. A loss in Detroit of 51% of its population between 1950 and 2009. You also see a column here <clears throat> that highlights the foreign-born population. Because most of you in this room know where I'm going with this. Immigration has had a big effect on New York. It has not had an effect on many cities in this country. It's many cities that saw manufacturing jobs leave and have not replaced their populations, the populations that left with those jobs. <clears throat> the transitions that occurred in New York's economy from manufacturing to service has not occurred in many of these other places. In effect, people left and a shell of these cities remain. Studying this is very important. And again, the role of immigration becomes obvious on this chart when you look at the percent farm born in many of, the, many of these cities. But that's not the whole story. This is a chart of New York's population. We know it's very big. New York's population <clears throat> is large by any, by any measure. More than twice the size of Los Angeles, close to three times the size of the city of Chicago. The Dominican population of New York is bigger than the city of Las Vegas. <clears throat> Think about that. <clears throat> we talk about major cities of this country as being six or 700,000. We have populations in the city that are six or 700,000. <clears throat> Single groups. Back in 1980, the city's pop surpassed 8 million for the first time, <clears throat> in, first time in its history, officially. We see that increments get added each decade <clears throat> as we go through to 2010. The population we expect will come in at 8.4 million. If it doesn't, then we can all, I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> but 8.4 million is our projection. Right now, the current population estimate is 8,392,000. So that's what we expect. This is misleading, though. You think New York as a hulk, and we add little pieces onto that hulk as we go on in time. Not true. It's not the way it works. This is the way it works. <clears throat> New York City's whole history is of the ebb and flow of people. <clears throat> when people ask, um, ask me about why their job never ends, community organizers, for example, people who provide social services, people who provide educational services, ask me why their job is so hard. Why is it that if we have 50,000 slots for English as a second language, that over time, everybody should ultimately learn English? We just add them all up, OK? Or somebody says to me, why is it, why is it that Year after year, I educate people about infectious disease in a clinic, let's say, it's not of Elmhurst Hospital, and the job 
never ends. It seems like everybody is always new. Well, the answer is everybody is always new. We have turnover in this city of at least 200,000 people every year. And the way I express it here is through these, what we call, components of population change. You see the bar on the bottom, net domestic migration. People say, wow, New York City is a safe city. But yet, our exchange with the 50 states, which is what net domestic migration is, it's the balance of people who leave for the 50 states and come in from the 50 states, is negative to the tune of 800,000 people. We exported 800,000 people between 2000 and 2009. Some people say, oh, that's bad. No, it's not bad. It's healthy. Here's why. Can you take in that number of immigrants, net international migration, our balance with the rest of the world, to the tune of over 600,000, without having people leave? What would happen? This, we could never do that, right? So in effect, <clears throat> what happens is this population exchange, this churn that is constant, that is constant. This churn does not exist in Cincinnati. It does not exist in Cleveland. It does not exist in Detroit. These places, nobody comes, nobody goes. The curse, the curse <laughs> is stagnation. That's the curse. And I'm, I'll tell you in a few minutes why it's such a curse. So you see that the net effect of migration on our population is about 200,000, the third bar up from the bottom. And then you see natural increase, the balance of births and deaths. We have more than 500,000 more births and deaths in the city of New York. Combine that with our migration, and there you go. Our population increase of about 5% or 400,000 people in this decade. You see that that's a product of huge forces that are at work, which is why all of your friends, when they come and visit you, go home exhausted. Because <laughs> there's no way you can have this, have the excitement of the city. It's why businesses uh, start up. It's why the energy to our economy that this provides and the working age population that it provides, because most immigrants are in the young working ages, between 18 and 34 years of age. Now, we are part of a metropolitan region. Can you see the five boroughs in the 31 county region? We have the inner counties, 12 of them on the inside, and 14 outer counties. <clears throat> One out of every four people in the region is now foreign born. One out of every four. The inner counties in the city resemble each other. If I show you that components chart that I showed you a minute ago for Nassau and for Westchester, pretty much the same. And more and more of our region is mimicking the city because of the influence of the foreign-born population. <clears throat> what effect does this have on composition? We have 3 million foreign-born in the city of New York. 3 million people. That qualifies by itself as like the fourth largest city in the United States, by itself. Back in 1970, the city was only 18% foreign born, only about 1.4 million foreign born. The main countries, in our 2008 data, you see the non-Hispanic Caribbean, you see Asia, you see Eastern Europe, Latin America, all represented. If I showed you this chart for Houston, half the pie would be Mexican. If I showed you this chart for Los Angeles, most of the pie, or a big chunk of it, would be Mexican, and what wasn't would be Southeast Asian. If I showed you this for Chicago, we would have a big chunk of it, Mexican maybe of oh, 45%. And what would the second group be? Who's from Chicago? Polish. Who said Polish? You're a winner. Absolutely. Good. It would be Polish. <clears throat> this says a lot. There were 122,000 births in New York City in 2007, and these are the top countries of the foreign born. 53% of all the births in New York City, remember that natural increase I showed you before, a half million? 53% of it is because of uh, immigrants. It's the indirect effect of immigration. And if you add these five countries up, you have about the top five, about one quarter of all births in New York City are to mothers from five countries. Now, why do we care? Because this is the future of New York. This is the future of the city. We know that the Chinese influence, the Mexican, Dominican, Jamaican, Ecuadorian influences in the city are going to rise because of the large number of foreign-born uh, births. This has diversified our population. <laughs> our Asian pop, look at that number, teetering on one million. I can tell you this, 
we have to get one million in the next census, Asian total. So I'm going to be very distraught <laughs> if we don't. 997,000 is not acceptable. <laughs> the Chinese pop, always between 40 and 50% of the total, going back to 1970. Asian Indian, Korean, Filipino, Pakistani, Bangladeshi. Look at the diversity even within the Asian pop. Hispanic pop, once two-third Puerto Rican, now about a third Puerto Rican, Dominican, Mexican, Ecuador. By the way, Ecuador is surging. If anybody knows why, I'd really be interested in hearing it later on. Central America, co uh, Central American, Colombian, diversity of our population. Now, <clears throat> here's the thing. We take all these people in from other countries and we benefit from it. Okay, in case you're curious as to what happens when you don't take people in from these other countries, you would pay a visit to some of the cities that I told you about earlier. What's happening in those places is that a hole is developing in the age distribution. Now, that's kind of a, a rather a, well, demographically fancy way of saying that people are aging in place. No one is replacing the young people who leave. If you grow up in Youngstown, Ohio, I'm not trying to pick on Youngstown. I have a friend who lives near there. But I'm not, I swear. I have to just pick some cities. Or if you live, you know, in, uh, let's pick a bigger city, Cleveland or uh, Columbus, Ohio, what you will see is large numbers of people who are aging in place. And they're aging. And you will not see people moving in. You won't see people moving out. You won't see much of that churn that I talked about. What you will see is people moving in, people, um, <coughs> Aging with no one to support the services for those people who are aging. What we call the dependency ratio, the relationship between the older population and the working age population becomes distorted. If you look at the cities of Japan currently, if you look at Northern Europe, Central Europe, you will see substantial dependency. Now, how do we define that? Well, right now in Japan, it's about 35 persons over the age of 65 per 100 working age persons. Just to give you perspective, the number for Saudi Arabia is five. Okay, Think about that. Five per hundred working age people. <laughs> Ocean County, New Jersey is pretty close to Japan. Uh, it's about 34 persons who are 65 and over relative to the working age population because it's a retirement community. New York is about 18. And one of the reasons why New York is about 18 is because we have a constant injection of vitality from our immigrants. Now, along with the vitality comes challenges. So nothing is free. We all know that. All right? There are public safety issues. We want immigrants to become part of the city. So we have challenges. And one of them, of course, is English language proficiency. 1.8 million people, five and over, in the city of New York are LEP, limited English proficient. It's about 24% of the population. <clears throat> It varies dramatically by borough. Everything I'm telling you varies dramatically by borough. We can stay here all day and talk about each of the boroughs individually because they're all different worlds. It's amazing. <clears throat> Part of one city, though, very important. So 1.8 million. Half of the 1.8 million LEP, the main language is Spanish. And you see the list, Chinese, Russian, Korean, and French Creole. And what I'm here to tell you today is, is frankly, um, this isn't going to change not likely to change much. The country's coming in. Large numbers of persons who have trouble with the English language need to learn the English language. This is part of the deal that we make in the city. Now my favorite part, the neighborhoods of New York. <laughs> now, this is a map of what we call PUMAs, public use microdata areas, which is a fancy way of saying these are kind of like community districts. There are 55 of them to match our 59 community districts. And then there's two things I want to do today. I want to first document the, uh, what is called the International Express. I don't know how I'm going to do this. I didn't bring my pointer. <laughs> going to like this. The International Express, the 7 train, starts in Times Square, at least for the time being. Right? We know that it's going to go eventually over to the, to the far west side. And it goes through northern Queens. On that little trip, you're encountering four or 500,000 foreign-born people. It's astounding. This is a national heritage trail. You work your way through Long Island City, Sunnyside, Woodside, Elmhurst, Jackson Heights, Corona, and Flushing. And it is one heck of a ride. You get off of 74th Street. You go eat on the Sari block there, the Jackson Diner, for example. You can get off in Sunnyside and Woodside and look at old and new transitions, Mexicans side by side with the Irish 
population that lives there. You can see one heck of a ride here. This is great. Queens is almost half farm born. Queens has always been held up as being the place. But today what I'm going to tell you is that they're getting, they're looking over their shoulder because Brooklyn's following them. <laughs> and I want to tell you why. <clears throat> We're starting to call it the Brooklyn horseshoe. What's happening in Brooklyn is as unique or more unique as what hap has happened in Queens. It's not only ethnic, it is religious. It has to do with religious bodies as well. I'm not saying that Queens, you don't have religious diversity, but you have some interesting observations in Brooklyn. <laughs> it all starts in Bensonhurst, which was the largest Italian-American community in New York. No longer the case. For all of you who are Italian, including me, the Italian population has exited to Staten Island, gone down to Florida, Ocean County, New Jersey, and up to the heavens. <laughs> <laughs> It's true. Population's aging. People are not coming in from Italy, in case you're curious. Oh, geez, thank you. In case you're, in case you're curious as to why people are not uh, coming in from Italy, just go to Italy and you'll see why. <laughs> That's my recommendation. So you're in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. You've got this vacuum of housing now. The Italians have left. So what's happened is the Chinese in Sunset, in Sunset Park which originally came from, who originally came from Chinatown, are moving under Borough Park into Bensonhurst. The fastest growing Chinese tracks are now in Italian Bensonhurst. They're being met up by the thrust northward from the, of the Russians from Sheepshead Bay, I'm not Sheepshead Bay, from Brighton Beach, and through Sheepshead Bay, through Homecrest, into <coughs> meeting up with the uh, Chinese in, in Bensonhurst. At the same time, in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, you've got the, one of the largest Arab communities in New York. Okay. For example, people from Yemen, just as one example. Now, can you come up into Canarsie? Canarsie has changed in the last 15 or 20 years, lock, stock, and barrel, from European to black West Indian. So what you have is this tremendous population of immigrants that have now kind of congealed here. Now, how do you explore this? You take the B or the Q train. Can you go? <laughs> Up to, uh, 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 you, you go up to Prospect Park, and you go over to Church Avenue, and you take the B or the Q train. Now, you know the B or the Q runs a bit underground, and, and you have to like come, get on and off. Can you get off at, um, I guess the best place would be Newkirk, and you walk west to Coney Island Avenue. You then go and get yourself a pita, and you sit in the pita store there, and you look at the schoolyard, and you look at the people who pass by. And what you will see is South Asian Muslim, populations from Pakistan and Bangladesh living side by side with a growing, and I mean growing, Orthodox Jewish community. New schools being built, new occupancy, new immigration, all occurring in this corridor which runs along the B and the Q train, kind of parallel to Coney Island Avenue, that runs, from, runs as one of my colleagues says, runs to the beach. Okay? <laughs> and you need to get on and off, though. And you go through places like Midwood. And what you see are not only ethnic mixes of people, but you see religious diversity that maybe you could find in a handful of places in the world. You would find it in Jerusalem, not too many other places. The one thing that, would, that is really different is that, by and large, the absence of conflict here. And this is part of something that I call the, the, the gentleman's agreement that people have. We don't have to love each other in this city, but we tolerate each other. Why do we do it? We do it because of our kids. We do it because, oh, God, I sound like I'm writing a speech. So what I mean, what I'm saying is that in the pursuit of upward social mobility, people will make sacrifices and will let things slide, will uh, let uh, tolerate their neighbor in ways that maybe in other places they would not. Because the primary focus is work, the primary focus is labor force participation, and we have the numbers to demonstrate that. And the primary focus is upward mobility for your children. Suketu Mehta, a friend and professor at NYU, wrote a piece in the New York Times Magazine a few years ago about a building near Lefrak City in Queens, net, where he said, people don't love each other. Oh, geez. I'm just curious, is that a 20 minute or a 25 minute clock? Can somebody tell me? Sam, is that running down? Is that 20? Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, okay. I just want to know if I have a minute left. So, all right, so, um, okay. 
So what ends up happening is you have situations where people are mixing together in combinations that make New York an incredible place. And that is, that will be the story 100 years from now. How did those people do it will be, will be, the, will be the question. Sam alluded to the fact that early on when, uh, uh, when New York City was the center of commerce in the 1600s, when people came over here, more often than not, I think as Sam alluded to earlier, people would say, uh, don't talk to me about differences between people. Do they work? Uh, let them work. It's everything in the interest of commerce. Well, lo and behold, here we are a few hundred years later, where in effect people are here to leave their mark, to make their mark for their kids. And that is what produces these kinds of uh, mixtures of people that frankly you will not see any place else. And you will not see in a way that is reasonably accommodating the way it is here. What are they doing? Okay, good. Now, um, <clears throat> I have some maps that I'm going to put up on the website, uh, that which will go up on the website if they're not already up there, to show you some concentrations of people okay, that uh, are in the city. And I want to point out this. This is our latest data on the Chinese population of New York. Everybody thinks about Chinatown in Lower Manhattan. Everybody thinks about the Flushing Enclave, and people think about Sunset Park. And it's true. There are some great restaurants on 8th Avenue and Sunset Park. But look at Bensonhurst. <laughs> Huge numbers, 30 or 40,000 now, Chinese population. And look at what's happening in Brooklyn. As amazing as anything you'd see in Queens. The former Soviet Union, we know, three quarters still live in Brooklyn. But look at the spread now. Look how it's moving up from Brighton Beach up into the southern Brooklyn. For those of you who live in Queens, you know that the population from Uzbekistan, the Bukharan population, lives near Flushing Meadow Park, Kew Gardens Hills. Uh, Kew Gardens up in this area, about a quarter of the total immigration from the former Soviet Union. And then I have to say this. <clears throat> my son and my daughter-in-law live in Woodside, Sunnyside. I have friends whose children increasingly live in Astoria and the area around it. Well, the Bangladeshi are the number one group now to this part of Western Queens, and especially to Astoria, Long Island City, in here. Mixing in with a lot of the children, a lot of our children, a lot of the kids who are moving, who are moving in from other parts of the country. Now, in the future. This is a chart, race and Hispanic origin. I apologize in advance for the categories. Demographers love to classify everything. Look at our population under 18 and 18 to 24. This is the future of the city. A mixture of people that is, we could argue, unprecedented in the city's history. The white population right now of the total is about a third of the total. The black population is about a quarter. The Hispanic population is nearing 30%, and we're over 10% Asian. This is. And look at the younger stage groups. Only one group where the European white population is disproportionately concentrated, and that is the POP 65 and over. Now, having said that, we are projecting an increase in population for the city. 9.1 million is what we project based upon a whole series of planning studies and demographic projections. And this is what I want to show you. The increase in the city's elderly population, defined as persons 65 and over, between 2007 and 2030, which is when we did our projection, and we're still holding to this, we're projecting that the city's population of persons 65 and over will increase by 400,000. That the percent 65 and over will rise for the city from 12 to 15 percent. The Bronx will be the youngest borough. Staten Island will be the oldest borough. Staten Island would have 18 percent of its population 65 and over. The message here is that the city's pop will age. <clears throat> but you'll notice the percent 65 and over at 15 doesn't even come close to what we're seeing in Central Europe, Northern Europe, parts of Japan, where the population 65 and over is approaching 25% of the total. And the reason for this is our injection of young people. And one point I want to I stress before I end. What we're finding in the last two or three years with all the economic problems in the country is that young people from the rest of the nation are finding New York City more attractive. We're taking in 
more younger people from the rest of the country than we have in the past. We think this is a function of the fact that New York is a good place to be when things are miserable. We also think it has to do with the fact that in Nevada, Arizona, Florida, Southern California, things are far worse in the economy, especially with housing. It's stunted our out-migration, increased our in-migration from the 50 states. We have tax return data that shows, we look at exchanges of addresses, that it's almost in balance, the number of people coming and going now. And those are primarily young people. So what do I want to say, because I have to end now, is this, that we are very, very fortunate in this city because we attract young working age people, immigrant and non-immigrant. People want to be here. A lot of that has to do with the maps I showed you before. This relative tolerance, we have problems, we know that. But relative to other places in the world, we're doing really well. And New York City has become a place that people want to be. And as long as that continues to be reflected in our demography, we'll do fairly well. Because for many places where people age, the aging is occurring all over the world. It's occurring, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. It's occurring in the developed world. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> it's occurring in the older countries, in countries where you don't have, um, you don't have an injection of young people. The results could be devastating for municipal budgets, devastating for planning. Because in effect, you don't have people to cause the energy to be generated that I call the population dynamic. So I am going to stop now. This is a, a Department of City Planning website. We have a whole bunch of data up there that we uh, put up, including our current assessment of what migration patterns are like in and out of the city. I thank you for listening and uh, appreciate the invitation. Thank you very much to the <laughs> Municipal Arts Society.